Welcome back to Up The Villa podcast. If you are new, subscribe to the channel. Get involved on the Tactical Debrief, where we go in-depth at Aston Villa 6, Brighton 1, which sounds mad every time I say it and write it down in a title, etc. But that was the score, 6-1 to Villa. Um, so we'll do our normal. I know a lot of you are really liking these Tactical Debriefs, look, looking at the team shape looking at the images, looking at the passing network. So we'll get into that in this episode as well. Uh, we heard Ryan's thoughts in the fan cam, but we'll get Hannah's thoughts, who's fresh off um, another media duty from the Villa podcast. We had a fantastic <laughs> weekend. We had TNT Sport video that me and Hannah filmed on the Crystal Palace game. I then was on TNT Sport. And then the day before, Hannah was on Talk Sport uh, chatting about Aston Villa with a Brighton fan as well. So we had a great weekend. So fair play. The pod goes marching on. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Hannah, what were your thoughts for Aston Villa 6, Brighton 1? I've just realised coming on here that my voice is quite hoarse. Um, <laughs> so. For any audio listeners, I do apologise. There was a lot of celebrating yesterday, and for good reason. We went into that game, I think the group of us, quite nervous. I know, especially me and Luke, you know, we'd expressed that we were a little bit nervy for this one. I think even though we've got such a good history um, in recent years against Brighton, it was just like, you know, we're coming against world beaters and Brighton are a very good side but there was just something about it that I didn't feel 100% confident about and I kind of kept thinking well we've got to lose at home in the league at some point and yeah I was probably being a bit cynical so to come away after that miraculous performance it was stunning it was I felt spoiled because you know so much of my years following Villa have been a little bit miserable so when we're playing like that now and we've got this manager and some of these players, I just almost have to pinch myself that I'm watching my football team and, you know, at full time, I'm looking at the league and I keep refreshing it because I can't believe we're in third place. Um, it was just brilliant. I thought to a man across the pitch, some brilliant performances. I thought Unai Emery got the tactics just spot on. Yes, that's easy to say when you come away with a big win, but genuinely I thought the team came out and they all looked so well versed in what they needed to do. And we just nullified them from the first minute and bar, you know, one sloppy goal again, disappointingly early on in the second half. I just thought we were brilliant. And I think now that is almost like a statement performance because people were still back in Brighton going into that game despite our good form against them, you know, not to uh, drop the media duties in, but even, you know, talking to the pundits on Talk Sport on, on Friday night, they couldn't believe that the Brighton fan was so nervous and they were really back in Brighton to come and do a job. And I think to come away now with, with such a big win, you know, we didn't just sneak past them, we demolished them. I think that shows that Aston Villa really mean business this season. And even though we are sort of in and around the same places as Brighton, potentially, we clearly can seriously outperform them, which I think is big street cred points for us. Yeah, when we first got Emery, we were all looking at those tactical masterclasses that he was producing, you know, the videos, um, the, you know, the coaching episodes where he was showing how well he'd done against, um, I think it was Liverpool and, and United. And, you know, this guy can have a plan. And when his plans come off, they are absolutely blockbuster. I mean, I've got a stat written down here that I've seen today. Uh, 32 games, Pep Guardiola in his thir first 32 games for Manchester City, he'd got 64 points. Unai Emery, in his first 32 games, Aston Villa, he's got 64 points. I mean, come on. What a stat that is. It's absolutely remarkable. Um, when what I he's see doing stuff like that, club. I just, I think it puts it into perspective because we obviously all think he's brilliant, but perhaps not quite as brilliant as he actually has been since he came in. When did we last leave a Villa Park Premier League game disappointed? 
Like to not <laughs> have a know. memory of that. I can't remember what game <laughs> it would have been. But how would it, like it feels ridiculous to even say that now? Yeah, it's it, it's it's fantastic, and I, I was watching that video. Of, I think it must have been the first goal, and Emery's like cheering, like, and I'm like, "That's me. That is in the whole tent. Like, I'm going absolutely berserk." And and he he's doing it on the touchline, and it's just great scenes. And you know, we we will go into the tactical side of things because it was something completely different against Brighton that we've not seen before, and those subtle tweaks, those little details that you see and you know I spoke about it I think it was the match reaction when I saw Dougie in that little triangle and I thought he's he's got a plan here and it, it just came into fruition so uh Ryan after the fan cams getting home I saw you did a little van cam so um how have you digested what we saw on Saturday yes I was very excitable and very joyful after the game um half 12 kickoffs <clears throat> love them absolutely love them we are we are up and out a bit early aren't we on a half 12 and <laughs> we startled startled newcastle and we and we did exactly the same to brighton but going back to what you said about emery um he he's unreal he is unreal detail 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 um it's just levels of detail everywhere and you, you see it game by game and we said it when he first come in like He's going to have a plan and he has got a plan for every single game. 99 times out of 100, it will be spot on and it will just be down to the players to go and execute that plan. And like yesterday, collectively, to a man, every every player on that pitch, every player that come on that pitch was just on it, was just on it. We brought energy they brought their top, top form and everything just come together so well. And we made one of the best coach teams, one of the most attractive playing styles. You know, a lot of teams look at Brighton and their whole model of recruitment and um, style of playing everything. We made them look so ordinary. Ordinary. It was, it was unreal and it was just an absolute joy to witness that type of football down Villa Park, it's you know something that we are not used to. Something you know, the education that Emery has delivered us as fans, you know, he's took us to another level of how we visualize football, how we expect our, our teams to play and, and come out. And God, just for life, give him a, <laughs> give that man a contract for life because I do not want to watch any other type of football than Emery Ball, you know. I mean. When I think of Emery and, and just this tactical ability, what he can do, it's just, um, I haven't seen this from a Villa side. I don't think in my lifetime, this just this tactical vision and implementation of a plan. And I think McGinn was talking after the game and he was saying, like, he just loves football. He, he yeah. literally loves football. We had we, we were in a team meeting at 8.45 on Saturday morning about this game. You know, they're up, they've had the brekkie, and they're straight into the, to the job at hand. So uh, I'm just going to show you what I was talking about with the, the triangle and, and the, one of the, the biggest things for me on, on how we played against um, Brighton. And I think for me, this shows the tactic and the different styles. And we have got a few slides, so they do differ in the way that sort of we operated. It wasn't just one dimension. It wasn't just one way of playing. And I spoke about before the game how to deal with Duncan Webster, and we went with this triangle here. So as you can see, you've got Watkins at the top of the triangle, you've got Diaby, and then you've got Dougie Louise, who is in such an advanced position there. But what we also saw in this game, which is something that Man City do, is Pau Torres was in and around that area in central midfield. This picture that I've got is him running backwards from that area, but Pau Torres was making part of that double pivot with Kamara. And I think that was absolutely brilliant. So then we had three at the back. So the shape of the team looked similar to this. 
So we've got Watkins, Diaby, Luis. We've got Pau Torres in this area here with Kamara. And then we made up that back three. We allowed Matoma a little bit of width because we knew that Cash had pace to burn. We knew that P Cash could deal with Matoma in that area. And then we left Luca Dean in that area. But then we can go back to where we defend as well. When Pau drops back in there, we saw Zaniolo in that area. We saw McGinn coming back in that area. But we also saw in this game that McGinn wasn't afraid to drift out of that position and go there. We saw Diaby dropping into pockets through there. But one player for me who I've spoke about since the game ended was Zaniolo getting into that area. Zaniolo was given sort of like, not a free reign, but a free reign to drift and make up and get into these areas. And some of the slides that I'll show you in a bit show that Zaniolo at times was our furthest forward player. He, he, he was making that actively acting as a striker. So Zaniolo's role off the ball for me in this game was, was absolutely massive. So Ryan, do you want to touch on any of those points that I've mentioned? You've mapped that out beautifully, Luke Robinson. <laughs> Absolutely spot on. Um, yeah, we, we did see all them tweaks and especially the Pau Torres one was very interesting seeing him um, step up into midfield and obviously Dougie Louise right behind that forward three. Uh, we was very, very narrow. Um, obviously, we've seen slides and everything of, of Brighton's build-up and how they like to play out from the back and especially with the two centre midfielders um, looking to receive the ball off the centre halves and then the, the, then the push on then. So that was a that was a key area to block off and, and Louise's presence in there, Zaniolo, Watkins and Diaby as a, as a narrow three there, forced them wide, forced them wide and it's not something that they like to do. Um, so that was just, again, Emery masterclass, <laughs> isn't it? It's, uh, it's brilliant and, and McGinn, God, he was back on form. He was back on form. He was everywhere, every blade of grass. He was brilliant. Um, but even if we if we go right the way back to Emmy Martinez, what I noticed yesterday as well was his kicking. It was long. It was long. We'd look mm. to fire it into the to the front three and um, play off them really. So when they held the ball up, you had the likes of um, Kamara, Louise, McGinn, forward facing, looking to receive the ball and attack and. You know, some of our counters on the on on the, on the break was really pacey. You know, DRB mm -hmm. gives us that other dimension of pace. Couple that up with Watkins, who again was electric. Um, his pace yesterday, so we really, really <laughs> rattled Brighton. And I think you, you said in the yeah. preview, didn't you? We had to we had to move their shape around, and, and we rattled them, rattled them bad. So um, yeah, it was it was such a such a great. Great visual, uh, tactical game to watch, and I'm sure a lot of teams will like use this br blueprint now as as a as a base to counter um, counter Brighton. Yeah, one thing you mentioned about Martinez's long kicks, which I noticed during that game as well, is we we really went with a two v two. So what we would do is we'd push. Zaniolo and Watkins up against two of their back players, which basically gave us an opportunity to win the ball higher up the pitch. I really, I really spotted that. So when we had these long kicks going in, it was going into an area with sort of like that 2v2 over there. So I thought that was fantastic. But again, I just want to show you and highlight something that I mentioned earlier was about when McGinn was dr drifting inside. You've got Diaby picking up that position there. McGinn's gone a little bit more central. You've got Kamara actively, you know, shepherding that area out right through there. You've got Zaniolo, like I was mentioning as well, getting further forward. Cash getting forward. You've got Luca Dean over there. So it really felt structured, but sort of quite fluid at the same time, which I just thought was was absolutely amazing in this game. Again, that, that was, in, that was of, an incredible pass as well, wasn't it, Luke, on that last yeah, slide, McGinn's, yeah. McGinn's slide ball. Yeah, and, and you know, you've got another shot here of, of Pau Torres stepping up out of position. You've got Zaniolo pressuring the Brighton player here. And then once we won that ball back, Watkins was away. Look how much space the has got. And we was able to sort of really exploit that back line. So our off-the-ball work, 
uh, was really good in this game as well. Again, for Watkins' goal, you've got the furthest player forward here in Zaniolo. Uh, we've also got our shape again in that sort of triangle. Uh, we've got our shape without the ball as well. So you can see, I mean, look how much space the rb has got there. You've got Zaniolo pressuring Watkins. He's trying to get on the ball. We're in a 4-4-2 shape when we're pressing uh, Brighton. But, you know, that, that space there for Diaby to get in behind there is just absolutely massive. Uh, again, we've seen here that you've got Zaniolo up top. You've got Watkins. You've got um, Kamara getting on the ball. Here's the other one as well. So normally, McGinn should be in and around that area there. But McGinn is playing in central midfield as well. So McGinn's role, he seemed to have quite a license, didn't he, Hannah? What was your vibe on McGinn's performance? Because to me, it was instrumental. I think he's having a brilliant season in general. And it seems to be when Villa play at their best is when John McGinn is really sort of orchestrating the game. Because I, I think we spoke a couple of weeks ago about, you know, could John McGinn potentially drop into a double pivot and where do we best see him? And I think at the time I kind of said, John McGinn thrives when he has that freedom of the park and he wants to dip in and out of areas and he wants to break up play. He kind of wants to be the person at the centre of it all, not in a, a way that he's he's selfish or he's greedy, but I think he loves that side of the game. And yes, uh, on Saturday, I think what really shone was John McGinn as a captain which perhaps when he first got it under Gerard, we, we didn't necessarily see because, you know, he's a lovable character in the dressing room, but you didn't always have him down as a captain. But one thing I always spot now is throughout the whole game, he's always communicating back and forth with Unai Emery, constantly the communications there. You can see him, he's talking to his defenders, he's talking to his attackers. He really is at the minute, that person in the middle of the park who I feel is keeping the flow of the team as it should be. And obviously when it works, it works brilliantly. I think he's even said post-match, you know, everything seemed to click. And I think a lot of that starts with him. He's really, really doing a lot of the work that doesn't get the glamour. You know, he, he doesn't necessarily have the goal contributions, perhaps that we'd even like him to have. But what he does do is so much of that hard graft that, I don't think any other any other player does. And I, I say it all the time, I don't know another player like John McGinn. The way he uses his body, you know, he's a physical player, he's a passionate player, and he's got an excellent passing ability, like the ball through mm. to, I think it was either Cash or DRB, excuse my memory, for, for one of the goals. Like his weight of pass is excellent. I just think when he's, when he's on and he's tuned in, he is... <laughs> absolutely essential to this Aston Villa team which for large parts in the last sort of two years after he had that foot injury you know we were really worried about John McGinn's future at Aston Villa we thought is he past it we're never going to get championship John McGinn back but we're seeing him at his absolute best and it's again total credit to Uno Emery for bringing that out of him but also to him for I think he very much acknowledges the fact that he wasn't playing at his best and he's really pushed himself to to be better. So we are very lucky to have him, I think. And again, 2.5 million quid. It's just <laughs> the bargain of the century, isn't it? Yeah, it's it, it's massive, to be fair. And, uh, you know, I mean, even at the minute, you know, we, we're sort of waxing lyrical over this, you know, performance. But we're by far from the finished article. We're going to get better this season. And I said this before the game. I felt like we, we, we're going to get better and better as the season goes on. And we've got a quote here from Emery straight after the game. The priority is the Premier League. but There's still plenty of work to do. You know, he's, he's not a manager that sort of just rests on his laurels and he just wants to improve, improve, improve. And he spoke about his own performances. He's, he spoke about his own aspirations this season to improve himself. So, uh, yeah, I, I, just, I just love that quote, to be fair. that There's still plenty of work to do. The Premier League is the priority. So we'll go through some of the slides. Um, weirdly, we had an XG of 1.83. They had a 1.77, which... Oh, mad. 
Uh, XG <laughs> shot map. Villa are in the light blue. Brighton are in the dark blue. You've got the match dominance by expected threat. Uh, we have also got Aston Villa's average positions from this game. So you can see number 12, Luca Dean, very, very advanced. You can see that number 22 position of Zaniolo. Really, you can see that back three, the two, four and 14. But the screening in front of it, you can see Bubakar Kamara, number 44, offering more protection. Double pivot vibe of McGinn and Luis, and then a focal point and a front two of the RB and Watkins. And that shows what this game plan was all about. The front two offered pace, power, and just that explosive nature. And that average position there is something that Emery would have been harping on about, something that we needed in this game to exploit those two uh, defenders in Dunk and Webster. Villa's danger creation came centrally, and then you've got Aston Villa's passing network. I'll let Ryan talk us through this passing network, but the one thing that I sort of can see more is bigger spaces and less intricate passing. So what what would you make of that passing network, Ryan? It's the first time I've clapped eyes on this network, and... What we've just talked about in the build-up to this image, really much there on the paper, isn't it, Luke? Um, yeah. Obviously, you've got Conza and, and Torres. Normally, we're used to seeing um, a strong network going out wide to Luca Dean and Cash. We haven't got that this time. It's a lot more narrow. You can This sort of replicates its average positions as well. Um, so you can see that narrow. Uh, you, can just, you can just get a gauge of the narrowness of how we, we plan this attack. And... Dougie Louise in, in that middle bit there. Again, network with everyone. Everybody's friend, Dougie is. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, he's, he, he was the first to the ball from the knockdowns. He was the one that was letting the strikers go, playing the balls through. It's um, Yeah, it was just all around a, a superb performance. And um, like you said, these different tactical tweaks are just backed up by these, these networks. And we're, we're seeing different ones every time. And, like Emery says, we're far from the finished article. I, I do, st part of me still thinks that we wanted to play with three at the back. And I think yeah. it sort of knocked us out of sync a bit at the start of the season. And we're just getting back on track. We're just adjusting. I think the loss of Mings and then the loss of Carlos scuppered our plans a bit. And we've had to adjust. And it's, it's taken a bit of time. But the thing is, with Emery, like when we are adjusting, and, and trying out new things and, and implementing different tactics and different styles. We still win football matches. And like we've won what we've won now, five, five out of seven games yeah. in the Premier League. You know, if if you subtract the off-field qualms about the, the ticket prices, the corporate areas, you know, the leisure warsaw defeat out the league club, if you solely focus on what we've been doing in the Premier League. It's been sublime and we should be celebrating this start because I, I, it's been a long, long time. Probably like when Gregory had like a great start to the season that we've had such a brilliant, brilliant opening seven, seven games so far. And like you say, it's just the beginning. You, you just know it's it's too... Sort of, it's, it's been too sort of disjointed to be proper fluid. So when it's like that, you know that it's going to improve. And um, these these we're, we're in for a great season. I think we are in for a top top <laughs> season. And you know, the likes of Chelsea, the likes of United, they're stuttering this season. This is like a massive opportunity for us. And you can see why the priority, as Emery is saying, is, is focus on the Premier League. And I think anything else. Is a bonus after that. You know, we are all desperate for, for silverware. And I think that was the disappointment against Everton that, you know, it's 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 an opportunity gone. But I think what we're sort of creating and what's building in the Premier League at the minute deserves um, full full focus and um, priority. Yeah, I mean, for you, Hannah, this, this has got to be the best time you've ever had as a Villa fan, surely. We were talking earlier about sort of the, the tactical ability of Unai Emery and I was sitting here 
you know, daydreaming a little bit, thinking about <laughs> when we were under, you know, Steve Bruce, Dean Smith, Steven Gerrard, you kind of knew every game what your starting lineup was going to be. You're going to play a 4 3 3 and you're going to have the same 11 players pretty much. And I'm just thinking now how different it is. And it's an education room at Unai Emery to be watching football that changes every week. And it's actually like it's an art form, isn't it? It's not just let me whack out who I think are my best 11 and hope for the best. So, you know, he's given us an education. And for people like me who are, you know, probably some of the younger Villa fans, it's the best football I've ever seen at Aston Villa, you know. I was still quite young in the Martin O'Neill days where we were, you know, pushing for you. We were playing in Europe and we were pushing for top four and never quite succeeded. So for me to be having this now as I'm really sort of coming into my Villa adulthood, it's, it's just, I feel that's like I said earlier, I feel spoiled. I just, it doesn't feel like it's my football club. Like growing up and, you know, you went to school with, Man United fans or Chelsea fans, even though we live in Birmingham, you know, they would always, you know, poke fun at Villa fans because at the time we were absolute poo. So it's like the bragging rights, isn't it? Of like our football club is something to seriously be proud of. And I think that's why when we get to come on here and talk about it and we get opportunities to do things where we can shout about Villa in mainstream media and, you know, be taken seriously, it's it feels even more special because we haven't had that for such a long time. Yeah. And I think again, McGinn did an interview after he's done another interview. that I can't remember where it was. It was some quote, and he was basically talking about Emery at Villa. And um, he was mentioning that playing at Villa Park is quite demanding because the Villa fans mm. demand a lot. Um, and he also mentioned that for the fans, it's probably took a bit of time to, like educate yourself on Emery and educate the way in which he wants us to play. And I, and I 110% get where he's coming from because for me, like I mentioned earlier in this episode, I've never seen a Villa manager do what Emery does. I've never seen him tactically change things. I've only ever seen Villa managers go out and do the same thing every time, every single week with the same players yeah. and just a, a player might win us a game. But when I was watching Villa in the whole tend on, on Saturday and I saw that little triangle and I saw Pau Torres going into midfield a little bit and I saw Pau Torres coming out from the back and trying to challenge and win the ball higher up the pitch and I saw us going with them two players on that left-hand side, you know, hitting it longer. I never, I, I never expected to go to Villa Park and watch that on Saturday, but it was those subtle tweaks, something completely different and you watch it and you can understand what he's trying to do. Like, I can understand why Zaniolo was next to Ollie Watkins. I can understand why that there was that little triangle. And I could see it working. And I think as a fan, to watch your team and fully understand what they're doing and how they're trying to play, I think that's a testament to how how good of a team we are. And I think, you know, it, it, it's, it's amazing to watch. Um, it, it really, really is. And yeah, He's, uh, oh, I'm just looking at look, it. Emery has got some balls. He has got some balls because, like you say, Villa Park is demanding. And look, I respect everyone's opinion down at Villa Park. But what was getting my go up was, oh, we need to stop this passing out the back. Stop this passing out the back. It's, you know, it's too slow. Come on, attack, attack, attack. And like other managers might have crumbled and not backed themselves. Emery's like, no, no, no. I've got a plan, I've got a philosophy. And I'm sticking to it, like, and things did get a bit rough down Villa Park for them couple of games, you know, the Leicester ones and the Arsenal one, the back-to-back -back when we lost 4-2 on both occasions. And um, then it was very vocal about not playing out the back and, and the pace of our play. But again, he just backed himself, backed himself, and he's so brave, do you know what I mean, to make these tactical, tactical decisions, ask players to play out of position, ask players to do something completely different. Look, Kamara was the one that was dropping back into that right-back position. Power is going forward. So the bravery to, to make these players perform in the Premier League arena at the demanding Villa Park, which we know it can be, it, you know, it's just full credit to, to, to him just 100% backing himself and, and, and backing the team and, and backing us now to support it. 
because like McGinn said it in that in that same uh, commentary that um, that he, he's got us on board and every interview isn't it. Emery will say good afternoon, good evening. The supporters, the next one yeah. is always the supporters, isn't it? Thank you to the supporters who have travelled the country. Thank you for connecting with us. And it's just it's coming together beautifully. And and yeah, like I say, we're in for a treat, aren't we? The next next twelve months. A part of that for me, and I was talking about it because I, I was sat in my seat yes on Saturday, and I watched Unai come out for his little pre match uh, interview with TNT. And it just got me thinking because I was kind of watching everyone's mannerisms around Unai and obviously he just commands the respect. But it got me talking about how Unai Emery himself is such a respectable man. And now this might be a complete different tangent, but the point I think I'm trying to make is that, you know, because he's so respectful to the media, to to everyone he comes in contact with, I think he demands that respect from everyone and that goes to the fans and the players. There's a lot of managers out there who are incredible at, at tactics and great tacticians, but, you know, they're a bit erratic or they're a bit spiky at times, whereas I just, Unai just oozes class and oozes just calm. Like we saw him on the bench. I can't remember what game it was. It might have been in in Europe where we were losing, and he was very, you know, uh, animated and frustrated. But he gets that out, and then he's straight back, and he knows what he's doing. And I just think he commands that respect from his players, and they respect him so much because not only is he is he excellent at his job, but he's a nice bloke. Like yeah, he's gentleman. so humble. So yes, yeah, so humble. Like everything he does is to serve the club and to serve the fans, and to develop uh, in every in every sense of the word. So I think that's another part of him that really is helping to build the club in the direction we want to go. Because he, you know, we are just sitting here waxing lyrical about him now, <laughs> but he's he's a top bloke, isn't he? It's class. The best. I mean, what one thing that was frustrating Emery on the touchline, and I did notice this in the game, was the referee. And he deserves a special mention from me because I thought he was absolutely terrible. Absolutely terrible in this game. Um, I just felt like all those little niggly foul. I felt like it was one of them where the ref was looking to send someone off and yeah. That, that, was it the one when he booked booked Conser for walking off from the goal kick or and then oh it was just it was just ridiculous. So I thought the ref had a really, really poor game and then it just sort of moulds into the weekend that the refs have had uh, across the board in Stockley Park, the, the Spurs one. It's absolutely ridiculous. There, there was another one on Sunday. Uh Brentford should have had a penalty. Um, the keeper sort of took out one of the the Brentford players, and oh, it's, it's getting it's getting really frustrating. And you know, this just this VAR debacle. You know, it's um, it's just not going well, is it? And and I think Summit's Summit's got to change with it because it, it's starting to get worse, in my opinion. Ryan, what was your thoughts on that Liverpool offside goal? Oh, yeah, absolute shocker. Absolute shocker. But for me, VAR, nothing wrong with the technology, nothing wrong with the equipment, the software, everything is spot on. It's the people using it. Like, it's mm. terrible. These are ex-referees or referees as, as well um, that are using this equipment and they should be the best people for it, but they're not. Like, error after error after error. And it's... What what are we in now? Probably four, fifth season VAR. Yeah, and we're still having these discussions. This was you supposed know to eradicate all all these discussions, yeah. but it's still still lingering on. The the worst part about some of these offsides is they are trying to eradicate sort of the human error from the linesman. But it's the human error at Stockley Park, which is also yeah. part of the problem. So it. Shows to me that it's the humans. Do you know what I mean? They're they're, they're just making those big time errors, and I, I can't understand why they never implemented that offside 
graphic at the World Cup where you sort of it sort of showed you, didn't it? Sort of it had like a like a line, a perfect line, and the body part that was over that little line, you could really see that it was offside straight away. And we saw again um at the weekend for Villa, you know, there was a couple of offsides, wasn't there? And play went on and on and on, and oh, then nothing oh, come of it, and then that yeah. flag goes up, and I'm just like when is it someone's going to get seriously injured in that phase yeah. of play when it's gone on and it baffles me. It, or it we're going to get to the me. end of a season. Like imagine if we get to the final day of, of this season and Liverpool are like two points, three points away from, from winning the title. And then they can be like, look, a human error, a single human error stopped us from potentially the three points that would have won us the league. And but but you can't do anything. They don't get any compensation. They don't get a replay. They'd, you know, because you can't. What can you do? But, but they uh, they get an apology post match, Anna. Yeah, you get an apology within within 60 minutes of full yeah. time. That's how bad you know, know you've messed up. The other funny part of it is as well, is I really like when they a couple of weeks ago they were really putting those um conversations out weren't they and you know when it was like sort of to the to the perfect scenario wasn't it so like everything went well and the ref yeah. was having that lingo with VAR and it was a great decision and I'm like why can't you just show us this one then and show us what went wrong and show us who got it wrong because until people start being accountable it, it you know it's like a kid, isn't it? Like a kid does something wrong and they go, oh, I'm sorry, dad. I'm sorry. And, and it's just, they're just saying sorry. Do you know what I mean? And they're not really sorry. It's just, uh, it, they're just saying sorry just to get out of like the little, little situation. But, you know, that's, that, that sorry is not going to help Klopp and Liverpool, is it? And no. it, 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 it's just really not good enough. And, you know, what 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 else? And I know I'm going on at the refs at the minute, but something that is really infuriating me as well is how sort of the refs at the minute have got this real sort of like brashness about themselves where they will like really just go up to Conta and give him a yellow because they think he's taking too long or someone does a little bit of back chat and they'll go, yellow card, mate. But where's that accountability? Like they make so many mistakes per game. And that they'll there'll be free kicks that they don't give and they should give, but it's just really annoying me how they're just like getting this little like trigger happy with the cards, and it's just like you know just concentrate on getting the proper decisions right. Do you know what I mean? I don't care if Louise has gone up to the ref and had a little word with him because he, you probably have made a mistake, mate. Um, so that's annoying me as well. That, yeah, just that, that Louise card one, out. He was in the first couple of minutes, wasn't he? And he sort of like run across each other and, and they, they clipped legs. But it was a harsh yellow card on Louise. And that was the opening five minutes. He's under pressure then for the rest of the game. And then this is what really, really annoys me. Now I can see why you've got your goat up as well. Because <laughs> the next challenge from the Brighton man, right? Probably worse than the one with hmm. Louise. Nothing. And that what infuriates me because... If you're going to book one person for something, right, you've got to book the opposition team for doing yeah. exactly the same. Consistency. And that is the most, yeah, consistency. And if, if you're not managing the game with consistency, like, do one for me because uh, it, it, well, it, it really annoying. It really, really annoying. Perfect irritating. example. How many fouls did Matoma make? He made loads, right? And I, I was watching the ref. Matoma made about his fourth foul. And, and he, he pointed to Matoma. Like, he was going like, one, two, three. That's it now. And I'm like, how's he got three chances here? He's made three fouls and he hasn't got a yellow card. And it's like, you're basically saying that those three little fouls aren't worthy of a yellow card. But mm -hmm. somebody else's foul, first one. Oh, it does mean Sorry that we've ranted about VAR on the officials, but I think it's needed because, the, you know, there's fine margins in the Premier League and there's a lot at stake each week for every single team. Now, for us, it was all right because we was winning six, we won <laughs> six one. But if those games do become closer, you know, those little decisions, you know, it's, they've, they've just really got to fix up um, big time because it's just not good enough. Um you know, there was that little rumour last week, wasn't it, that the, the FA are going to have to pay the refs like £100,000 
more because Saudi want them. And I'm like, oh, let, let them go. Let them go. Get rid. <laughs> book that flight and get them yeah. over there. Because, um, you know, we had that ref for the, um, was it the Hibs game? And I couldn't believe how good he was, that Hibs, that Hibs ref at home, you know, the officiating in that game. And I was just like, God, he made it. It, it was so free-flowing. But when he needed to, he'd give a foul. And I think that, that Hibs ref uh, was probably the best ref I've probably seen at Villa Park for ages. Because I've, I've always thought that, Luke, because like, we've got the greatest league in the world, right? Arguably the greatest league in the world. With some of the greatest players in the world, why not go out and get the greatest referees in the world? You know this this law where I don't know I don't know the actual law for it where, where you have to have referees from your own country, um, but surely surely we, we should be able to pick referees from all over the world to come and manage in the world's biggest league that's watched all over the world. You know it's it's yeah. It really does need looking at, and it, it's gone on for so, so long, and all these people making a living out of it, and just no improvement at all. Yeah, I, I remember mm. back in a lockdown, like, and, and VAR had just come in, and like they had a chance there to to regroup and, and sort it all out, and then within the first game, like, it, it, it's mistake after mistake after mistake, and there just never seems to be any improvement. Every summer, yeah. there'd be a new rule or something that would come out, and it would just make it worse. You know, it, you know, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't never improve. It just, it just becomes one more crappy decision after crappy decision after crappy decision. It just, oh, it's infuriating. I mean, infuriating. It, look, this is the this is the last one, and then we'll go right. Basically, this one, it, 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 it's, I think it's a bad bad decision. So when we was at Liverpool away. And Sabozlo scored that goal. And there was a Liverpool player blocking Emmy Martinez, his eye line. And he gave the goal. And even against Brighton for Aston Villa, for one of Watkins' goals, Zaniolo standing in front of the goalkeeper. You know, I'd have been fuming if he'd have disallowed that goal. Because you'd have been like, where's the consistency? So... It kind of feels like now that if you block the goalkeeper's eye, eye line, it don't make no difference anymore. And, and that rule feels different now, whereas before it shouldn't have been a goal, but now they're giving them and it's just weird. And don't get us started on handball, because what is handball these days? <laughs> You've got to have your Adam. arm like, <laughs> honestly, they say unnatural. What's unnatural about any position of your arm? All of it's like the natural movement of your body. Some of them they give, some of them they don't. It's just like the most inconsistent rule in the whole of football. But that's for another day, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll, 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 leave, we'll leave that one there then. Um, so hopefully you've enjoyed this episode. We've gone into great detail on many different aspects of Villa's performance. Uh, we will then have our preview for the game in Europe with a predicted lineup as well before the game. We will have fan cams as well uh, for the European game. So if you do want to get involved, come and say hi and, and become part of the fan cams. So cheers, everyone. Up the Villa. Up the Villa. Up the Villa.